This week, Eyal Nemani comes on to talk about domain exploitation and malware in the Olympics hack, which I think is really interesting. Eyal works for our sponsor, Javelin Networks. We'll come on to talk about that. We haven't really talked much about the uh, Olympics hack, which was uh, all the rage. That is until someone launched the largest DDoS attack uh, in recorded history. Now that's all the news. Uh, but we'll go back to the Olympic sack and talk about that in uh, today's segment. In the enterprise news, IoT security or insecurity, uh, developer training, uh, security company launches a new media site, Solar Winds, AlgoSec, and because there wasn't much news in security, because I think people have gone dark because of RSA, we're going to talk about Wu Tang Clan. All that and more on this episode of Enterprise Security Weekly. This is Security Weekly, for security professionals, by security professionals. Broadcasting live from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island, it's the show where we talk security vendors and aren't afraid to name names. It's Enterprise Security Weekly. Was, uh, ha- the teleprompter now has artificial intelligence, Doug, and updates itself. It's awesome. <laughs> uh-huh. Uh, this week and talk about them as it relates to enterprise security. You're going to do great. <laughs> we're gonna, we're gonna, I, I think that people think that you and I talk like every day at night. You know, yeah. it's like, hey, what are you doing? It's kind of a bit of an exhausting week. And I think that we noticed that a little bit in the uh, stories for this week as well. Stop attackers from domain credential theft and lateral movement with a 99% success rate by using artificial intelligence to control the attacker's perception of the environment. Javelin Networks is the world's first endpoint intrusion containment platform to protect domain networks. Javelin detects targeted attacks and breaches by obfuscating Active Directory, domain controllers, domain identities, domain credentials, and all domain resources. It only takes one compromised machine to jeopardize the entire organization. Don't be a victim. Visit javelin-networks.com and request a demo of AD Protect today. Are you worried about PCI compliance? Does your development team understand or care about security? Are you ready to face a breach of your customer's sensitive data? See the worst that can happen before it does. Black Hills Information Security can help you help management see the future. Email consulting at blackhillsinfosec.com to find out how a web application penetration test can mitigate the risk before you go live. Minerva Lab stops malware that traditional antivirus solutions cannot block. Minerva works with your existing anti-malware tools to stop evasive threats by deceiving them into a dormant state, dramatically increasing your rate of prevention. Minerva's solution does not require ongoing care and feeding and will not get in the way of business users. With Minerva, adversaries have to pick their poison, implement evasive tactics and get caught by Minerva, or don't employ evasion and get stopped by AV. To learn more and request a demo, visit minerva-labs.com today. Welcome, everyone, to this episode of Enterprise Security Weekly. It's actually episode 82 for Wednesday, March 7th, 2018. I'm, of course, your host, Paul Asadorian, coming at you live from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island, on the lines via Skype. None other from a snowy, most likely South Dakota, that's pretty much, you know, an accurate statement most of the time uh, during the year, Mr. John Strand. John, welcome. Thank you very much for having me on the show. I'm actually very glad to be here. There's a bit of weather that came through in Minneapolis, St. Paul. It's coming out your way. Um, I think you guys are supposed to get some snow here in the next couple of days, too. But yeah, we got hit by that storm, moved to Minneapolis, got hit there, and uh, coming out your way. Yeah, it's wonderful. It's going to start tonight. So uh, we got a fantastic show. I want to start with a couple of quick announcements. Uh, John, you and I actually have a pretty big announcement, which I, think I should it's kind teased. of an important thing. Yeah, I think uh, we've been talking about this. Yeah, but we've Shoot. talked about this for a while. Tease the beginning, kind of uh, maybe two years officially in the making. Yeah, um, yeah, two years. Still going strong. I think one of the <laughs> the uh, well, there's a couple of before we get to the actual announcement. There's a couple of, like pre announcements. You know, one, of course, John and I started offensive countermeasures uh, a couple of years ago. Before that, John and I were presenting on various topics uh, on uh, active countermeasures or offensive countermeasures. And so the big one of the big news items is we've changed the name from offensive countermeasures to active countermeasures, which I think is just more accurate. And really, that's the mm-hmm. story uh, behind it is it's just really more accurate as to uh, what we do. Yep. Uh, secondly, can we announce that Chris Brenton has now joined the team? <laughs> oh wait. I just, yes. I just did. Okay. Good. <laughs> just, we're done. Yep. <laughs> 
So it's been awesome. Uh, it, it's really, it's amazing. It's like surreal to me because Chris was one of my teachers, uh, literally and figuratively, you know, in information security uh, and pressed upon me, not just technical knowledge, but like kind of the person I wanted to be in InfoSec. And when John's like, you know, Chris wants to come on and help us. I'm like, well, yeah, uh, that's awesome. Um, and John and I, of course, have a lot of things going on. Uh, and Chris was like, no, I want to I want to come help you guys. And we're like, yes, please, please do. That would be great. Uh, so I could think of no better person to, to join John and I uh, than the fabulous Chris Brenton. Uh, John, if you have anything to add there. No, basically, Chris Brenton came in specifically to do all the things that you and I failed to do, which is effectively run uh, uh, active countermeasures because yeah. you're, yeah. you're you're busy with security weekly and building an empire, and I'm building busy with Black Hills Information Security and Sands. And Chris was just awesome. And so uh, we have a, a commercial that we uh, we put together for everyone uh, with a link in the end. And basically, we've been working on the, the messaging. I mean, it's funny because we talk about messaging from other companies, and here's our company. Um, so our messaging uh, is today's determined attackers easily bypass even the most advanced network defenses. Trying to ramp up staff to detect their back doors can cost thousands of dollars and take months, even years, or if ever, like at all, uh, in some cases. With Active Countermeasures AI Hunter, which is our, our product, AI Hunter, we're able to, uh, to we, we actually enable even junior analysts to detect even the most advanced backdoors in a matter of hours. Sign up for a demo and or purchase our product today by visiting activecountermeasures.com forward slash ESW. Active Countermeasures make every analyst a hunter. There we go. And we're off to the races now. Yeah. So you can go demo it and and check out what uh, John and I and and the larger team, uh, including Chris and many others, have been working on. And uh, yeah. So let us know what you think. Um, With a couple of conference announcements coming up, uh, Source Boston, InfoSec World, Secure World Expo uh, are all events that we're going to be at and you can find all the discount codes in the show notes at wiki.securityweekly.com. Again, this is episode 82 of Enterprise Security Weekly. I would now like to jump right into the stories, John. And again, the stories I think are light because RSA is coming up and having worked for a vendor for some time and follow the security vendor space very closely for an even longer time, I know that right before big conferences like RSA and Black Hat, you're working on stuff. You're ready to make a product announcement or some type of announcement for the company, usually product-related. Um, usually, it's not an integration. Usually, the reservations are held for new product announcements, new either a new product or a new feature. And it, right before RSA and usually Black Hat, there's kind of like a quiet period where everyone's mm-hmm. like, you know what? I'm not going to announce anything now because I want my big splash to be associated with uh, the conference. So. And you're, and you're, and at that, and that, that's kind of, I think that that's a crappy approach. I know that we have people in the industry that listen to us and here's a piece of advice. If you're like, we're going to wait for a big splash in RSA, you're doing it wrong because you are literally arguing and competing and fighting for mind space with like 250 other companies that are announcing yeah, things as well. And it's very easy to get kind of swept under the rug. So don't try to build things up all the time for the same week that everyone else is building things up. It's just bad form. You know, John, we and we did uh, exactly that. We we made an announcement right now in the quiet period, which I think is a great yeah. time, as you said, to make yeah. a product announcement because no one else is making product announcements. So we'll so just take we, it. We made our product announcement uh, now before RSA, uh, and everyone else's product announcement will come out our, at RSA, and inevitably we're going to miss some here on the show because everyone's announcement came out all at once, so some are going to lag behind. Some we, we just may not even come on our radar because there are so many uh, happening at once. So I think that's really sound advice. And we took our own advice, which is kind of hilarious, actually. But we do have some amazing things this week, though. Uh, Some earth-shattering news stories, Paul, that we should probably get get into. Sorry. What I found interesting about this first article about IoT security, specifically talking about IoT security with relation to it in the enterprise, uh, which we don't often find articles... Uh, on this topic, we tend to think of IoT devices being in one of two places. We put them in mm-hmm. consumers, certainly, and we put them in industrial control systems. And then outside of that, the enterprise is like, no, we don't have an IoT security problem. We don't have IoT devices. And then as you read this article, Trustwave did a, a study, a survey, 
And they have all these numbers in the survey percentages. 61% of companies surveyed who have deployed some level of connected technology have also had to deal with a security incident that they can trace back to an IoT device. Uh, only 49% of those same businesses surveyed said they have formal patching policies and procedures in place that would help prevent attacks. And then 24% of respondents say they've dealt with malware infiltration through an IoT device. I'm like, wow, those numbers are really fascinating. My gears start turning. And then you read down to the bottom of the article where they state uh, the very last sentence, the survey was conducted in November 2017 with 137 members of a survey panel, which is an extremely mm -hmm. small sample size, in my opinion, to start pulling those big numbers and talking about who's paying attention to IoT security and who has patching practices and who doesn't. I think most organizations don't even know where all their IoT devices, and if you do, how do you know that you have been hacked, and how do you know if you have a patching policy in place or not? Well, you probably don't, because you don't know they exist, so even if you do, you're not going to patch them. Well, it, and this is, like, initially whenever I first started reading this article, I was thinking in terms of like, oh, great, it's another article that simply says that we're not patching IoT devices, and as I read through the article, I, I realized, oh, great, this is another article that's saying we're not patching IoT devices. Um, it, but after, you know, all joking aside, the one thing that kind of gets me about this is, do you remember what was the website that you started up like five, oh, yeah. six, maybe seven years ago uh, that we were trying to start tracking this and you were jumping up and down on tables at conferences saying that this was an impending thing that we needed to look yeah, at right now? It was now. securityfail.com. Securityfail.com. I think Larry still and, owns the domain. The hilarious thing is we left a DNS uh, record in our DNS because we took the site down, right? So the site mm -hmm. went away. It was never hacked. You heard that rumor. It's incorrect. Um, so we left the site. We, the site was running for a while. It wasn't getting any traction. It was attacked more than any other site that I, I've ever had to defend, I think. And that's saying something. Yes, actually. and that is saying something. <laughs> and so we decided, you know what, we're just going to take it down. And so we took it down, but we left the DNS entry. Um, so we destroyed the virtual uh, you know, server. The, it was a server hosted in the cloud. And that mm -hmm. IP address got recycled to like someone in the security community, ironically enough, or someone who figured out that, hey, there's still a DNS record for security pointing. failed, pointing to here and put up like a spoof site and was like, oh, haha, ha, you guys got hacked. It, it, and, and there was, was lots of funny. Uh, it was funny. And there was lots it of attempts to hack security fail just because of the irony around hacking securityfail.com. Just the name. But this is something like the, the embedded device hacking book uh, back in 2005, I think. Uh, moving forward. And one of the things that this article talks about is how this isn't something that's new. It's something that's been cascading and getting worse and worse and worse and worse over time. And what bothers me the most, and I want to get your opinion on this, Paul, is this by and large is not a problem that enterprises can solve. I mean, they can solve it within their own boundaries. But a lot of the issues that we saw with like the uh, the Dyne DNS uh, DOS attacks, like all the attacks against the Internet of Things lately, it isn't necessarily because enterprises haven't been patching. It's just the tremendous amount of garbage that's out on the Internet that everyone's throwing out there. So this is becoming a much more larger issue for the industry as a whole than just individual enterprises patching their own things. And I'm not saying that that's not a problem. I'm just saying that the real problem with IoT is that there is no easy fix to this at all unless you unilaterally get everyone together to try to fix all their crap. Yeah, I think the the one point this article made was that really they break into them to launch denial of service attacks. And, yes. and, and that's the number one use case, which I think largely is why many enterprises don't pay attention because... The, the, the threat vectors aren't being uh, aren't bubbling to the surface and certainly there's other activities going on but for the most part people just use them for DOS attacks and that's pretty much the the cases that they cite in this article uh, are things like Mirai and other incidents like that I thought there was another use case they had in here but anyway and it was nice to see some numbers like you said it was a small sample set yeah. but you know what 137. That's not bad. I mean, it's better than a lot of the FUD that's been floating around. And I commend Trustwave, which, wow, that sounds weird. I just said that out loud. Um, I commend Trustwave for actually getting some real statistics and actually querying uh, people to get their uh, get their background on this. And that's cool. We need more of this type of reporting. So I, I thought this was a good article. You know what? Um, I you know I I think we kind of um, poked fun at not that's not the right term, but we pointed out that it was a small sample size. Um, and kind of hinted that that would invalidate some of the results. However, 
given yeah. the small sample size, I read through the entire article and it was very thought provoking uh, for me and certainly provoked this discussion, which I thought was good. So in that sense, I also commend Trustwave. I said that out loud too, because um, even if they had a small sample size, they wrote a very thought provoking uh, article that kind of makes you think about what is the, are the real problems? What can we do to raise awareness and, and all those other issues? They pointed out uh, specific, the other specific example was Bluetooth vulnerabilities uh, on those devices that uh, also had some vulnerabilities like Blueborn that are in printers and smart TVs. And I tell you what, if there are two classes of devices, Trustwave hit the nail on the head. Inside of an enterprise today, the data that I've, well, you don't need data to understand that there's a ton of printers in everyone's environment. All right. No one's going to argue with me on that one. You, you mm -hmm. can try, but I, I guarantee if you go look in your environment, there's like you're going to uh, have printers, two printers for every person uh, <laughs> is usually how organizations roll. Right. The other device that's in a lot of enterprises that people don't realize are smart TVs. And the reason I can say that with certainty is because when Andrew Hay worked for open DNS, he did analysis on the DNS queries from all these organizations and, basically through data analysis stated that the number one IoT device in enterprises today are smart TVs based on the DNS requests. I mean, that's a pretty mm -hmm. pretty good reference uh, to have. And if you think about it, we go buy a TV, maybe we are connecting it to the network more today because when you get into a conference room, you can stream to it from your phone or other device and just stream directly to the TV. You don't need any other kind of technology. You just put the TV there. And in that case, it's network connected. And maybe you're not applying updates because it's out of the scope uh, of your IT processes and procedures. Yeah, absolutely. All righty. Developer training is the key to implementing DevOps, says CA Veracode. <sighs> I'm, I'm, I'm not going to argue with any article that says people need more training. It's I, true. I, it's I, true. Well, I mean, you're biased there, but that's okay. A little bit. Uh, a Just little scared. bit. <laughs> but, I, you know, I think that uh, I think that we sometimes look at training as uh, kind of a silver bullet. And I'm not disagreeing that we, we don't need more training. And, and like John said, even, um, you know, people who aren't vested in, in training and security, well, training is a good thing. I mean, we're not going to argue that like we shouldn't train our developers because there's some kind of negative to it. I think the only negative is that when they're when they're training, they're not running code, and that could be problematic for productivity. But uh, that aside, having your developers trained in in DevOps or security or both uh, is a good thing, right? I, I, and no one's well, going to argue with me there. Right? I don't think. And, I mean, and you might... and I, we we try to stop. Uh, we try to talk the DevOps talk, and there's people that actually do understand DevOps, like Apollo, mm -hmm. that are very good at correcting you and me uh, because. We, we get it wrong because we're old dinosaurs. It's a brand new paradigm shift. And it is in the way that people actually look at doing development. And the vast majority of organizations, even though over the years they talk about agile programming and all these different methods, they're really still just using some type of modified reskinned version of waterfall because mm -hmm. that tends to fall back into human patterns and the way that we like to develop code. But Working with the development team, and that's one of the reasons why we brought Chris in, is Chris actually does get DevOps. And seeing what a fundamental difference it makes in our developers whenever we get a percentage of the DevOps approach in mm -hmm. place, it actually does make a big difference. And some of the things that I think are, are, are fundamentally changing the way development works is usually when you're developing is you check out some code. And you make some changes, then you submit it to a staging branch or you have your own branch and all the developers are working on their own separate branches. And when you try to merge it all together, it's an absolute nightmare. Mm -hmm. And with DevOps, the idea is you have a main branch. You are pushing directly into a main branch and you need to make sure that your code is working. And then you're also automating test scripts to make sure that your code doesn't break other people's code and the entire Build yep. doesn't break. And that's right. a fundamental different change. Also, you're not doing releases once every three months. You're literally releasing all the time. And yes, that's going to cause things to break, but that's the point. Mm -hmm. um, they always break when you release code. So instead of it breaking once every three months and everyone runs around like with their hair on fire and they learn some lessons that three month period, do it all the time. And yes, you're going to break some things, but you're going to come up with some procedures. You're going to come up with some scripts to make sure that the system is actually resilient. You have automated test cases and you get better at releasing code. And I think if you had to boil down DevOps and what it means for me, whenever you're talking about uh, why I think there's valuable, whether well, there's value in it, that idea of constantly releasing code and constantly dealing with the issues that come up and improving your overall process to make the, make sure that those issues go away, that's where the true value is. But like this article says, 
people have to be trained in that. Um, we didn't get proper training for a lot of our developers. We said, pretty please do X, Y, and Z. And it was painful. Whereas I wish that there were some good DevOps training classes out there, and there are, that we could have sent our team to. It would have saved us a lot of money in the long run. I think the other aspect I was thinking of too is when you're a developer and you're writing code, your number one goal is to make sure that your code works, right? Mm -hmm. and, and I think that training that we've talked about, security training for developers is making them aware of what cross-site scripting and SQL injection is, for example, so that when they're writing their code, it's in their minds that, oh, I don't want to write in a, a SQL injection. I, I think largely that's the wrong approach. I think that we need to have training for developers to write the most resilient code possible, to write code that it basically not um, written to wipe out vulnerabilities that we preach about, but write it so that it's resilient to all kinds of other things, all kinds of adverse uh, effects that you might not consider. In the end, I think we get better quality code, more reliable code, and more secure code all in the same time. Now, that's not yep. DevOps. DevOps is a great process to implement based on what I just said, but DevOps isn't like that magic, I wave a wand and we have really awesome uh, performing resilient software that doesn't have any security bugs. Yeah, and, it, and it's hard because like I said, it's a fundamentally huge shift in the way that development works. You and I cut our teeth um, 15 to 20 years ago whenever we were doing development, working in environments kind of as grunts. And this is an absolute complete date game changer in the way it actually does work. And they don't teach it at colleges, really. Um, you have a lot of your older developers that are, that have been around like you and I have that are resilient to this type of change or re resistant, kind of resistant to this change. So yeah, it is, it is absolutely a game changer. And it's one of those things you and I have discussed. I wish that we knew it better. It's just, we don't have time. Um, because you know, it's, it's a completely different way of looking at everything. There is a lot of, uh, attempts and I've seen this quite a bit, you know, working in marketing and, uh, studying security companies today and how, uh, you know, what their go-to-market strategies are, what their marketing strategies are, what their, you know, problems their product are solving and how they uh, communicate that, in essence, to, to do the show and the, the webcast here on, the, on this uh, network. But one of the things that companies will do, and I, it's, a, it's kind of, it's a weird thing. Like, I feel like sometimes it works, but not, it's a very rare case where it does. And it depends on your definition of working. But it usually starts in the organization when, someone in marketing or an executive says, we need to have thought leadership. And everyone's like, oh yeah, mm -hmm. I want that. I want, I want to be a thought leader. And we need to have thought leaders that are, are talking in our product space about being thought leaders. And they're like, well, we should create our own website with a, with a blog and we'll have thought leaders put, put up posts and it's going to be great marketing. I, I think what happens is, and I understand the approach, and I, and I think it's a good thing in terms of, their sometimes underlying goal is they want to give back to the community to present their company in a positive light. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. John, you and I have done that. I mean, that's yep. one of the reasons we started this podcast, you know, 14 years ago. And, and, and that's good. But in today's day and age where you have to differentiate, differentiate yourself from so many different security vendors, having a thought leadership piece that is so disconnected from your product um, like doesn't help. It may help a little bit with some branding, you know, maybe some goodwill in the community, nothing wrong with that, but mm -hmm. it, it has to be coupled with some really great product marketing that is product specific without being too salesy. And the thought leadership piece, I think just, it's just way too outside of like Tripwire has the, the state of security blog. Great blog. It's fantastic. They do awesome work. But you, you read that blog, it has nothing to do with Tripwire. Nothing. It's just yeah. a branding effort, and that's okay. But like when re I read stuff about Tripwire, I want to know what their products are doing too. Like where, where's that information? And they're varying mm -hmm. levels. And now Dubo has created one called Decipher, which is another effort to have this you know, overarching uh, kind of branding effort. I think your mileage is going to vary. Um, this one is, is really interesting because one of the things that you'll do when you come up with a new blog when you're a pretty decent sized company is hire people to design the blog and uh a lot of people don't have say over that design other than like one person in marketing and the designers and you end up with pictures that i think you need 3d glasses to get the full effect is that is that yeah i, I think that's what's going on also on mouse over uh for any of the articles like let's say are are you your phone number identity and mobile apps 
if you hover over that lettering, it turns into this 3D green and red thing, mm -hmm. and you don't want to click it. Um, it, it makes it gives like, you a headache. It's just horrifying. Yeah. Um, this is without question the worst designed website I have seen since like like 2002 with flashy gifs and little gophers that are dancing at the bottom. It is so bad and so painful. Uh, Which is a shame because actually the the feature article they have on the site now is actually really good, and I encourage our listeners they're, to go. They're check amazing it out. articles, <laughs> and they're extremely well written. The loft one oh, is yeah, amazing. On um, dude, the the uh, uh, journalist journalistic aspect or the you know uh being whoever the editor in chief is i forget uh who it is i think it's someone with a, a deep background whose name i recognize uh i think uh who, dennis uh, who fisher wrote this? it's dennis I... it's dennis fisher he was one of the founders of threat post uh i believe yeah and, and, and it's so... done like uh, uh there was a book called i want my T uh, mtv mm -hmm. um that's a great book and it's an oral history of i of mtv and it's written exactly like this yeah. where it's basically yes. a topic and everyone's little quotes on it it's amazing this is a great article all their it articles is. are great but all of their text pictures are fuzzy and in 3d like it literally yeah. gives you a headache to read their website it's a shame a lot of work went into this article in the loft and you know visual aspects aside try and ignore those and, and go read the article because they interviewed yeah. several people from the loft and just did a fantastic job putting uh the content together and then you and know someone you on this article, came up with a solution to this entire problem of this website uh he said the website looks fantastic on links um, there you go. there's no image issues whatsoever if you just use links as your browser well and you know what i found too uh is that i use uh instapaper and uh flipboard so flipboard is an app for your phone and Instapaper is another uh, like cloud-based like reading. You can tag articles and it sends it up to Instapaper. In both those platforms, they tend to strip out a lot of the visual and design elements from the source of the news article. Of course, still crediting them, but you can just read like the text, which is great. It's awesome. Uh, so that, that could work uh, for you as well. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So we also did a, a, an interview series with uh, some of the member, former members of the or original members of the Loft group. Uh, and you can find that in our archive. So I, I highly that, suggest you check that out. What show well. was that? That was one of it our was, big ones. I it was, was like out there for that. And it was fantastic. We didn't get them all on at the same time, but we yes. got them on at different times. It was amazing. We did a, a, a quite a number of them uh, in a, a group interview that aired, I believe, on episode 500. And then uh, after that, we were able to get a hold of Mudge and we interviewed Mudge uh, as well. So uh, you can find those on our YouTube channel. Uh, Solar Winds um, has a network path analysis. Oh, wow. oh it releases Trace Route NG. I don't know what. Yeah, well, I, I, I don't. <laughs> I don't really get this. Like a Trace uh, Route. Like I, I've had Trace Route for a long time. Never uh, had a problem with it. Yeah, in in fact, you can you can tweak a lot of the Trace Route tools. Uh, both the built-in one. I think the built-in ones and some of the, um like open source ones, utilities that you can install, let you tweak all the different options to use all the different uh, protocols to actually do the trace route, right? Because ping is obviously blocked. And so there's other your TCP trace route. Uh, those have been, I mean, there's just, you can just use those. I don't understand why Solar Ones is so excited about trace route NG. It actually looks harder to use than the trace route <laughs> built into Unix and Linux. I mean, they're like, yeah, you can switch protocols. It's like you can... You can do that with the Linux version of, of Traceroute as, yeah. as, as well. Sure. Um, I, I don't I don't get it. Um, this once again, this is their pre RSA announcement. So let's cut them some slack. Like, what are we going to do to generate hype for RSA? Let's let's release Traceroute NG, and everyone's going to be like, Yay! Tra I, I, Traceroute. I think I want to say Ed Scotus like did all this with Netcat. Um. <laughs> Um, no, he never no. did it with uh, Netcat, but we did have extensive uh, write-ups on the importance of using Traceroute, moving between TCP Traceroute, Layer yeah. 4 Traceroute, ICMP, uh, UDP as well, talking about how it actually works, identifying hops, because it is a big deal, but mm -hmm. all of these things are built into the existing Traceroute gotcha. tools that are out there. And Nmap actually will automatically do Traceroute, and it does an intelligence tra intelligent yeah. Traceroute. Yeah, I thought so you can do Traceroute to Nmap. thousands of hosts. Actually, Paul, you've been in this class. I'm literally reading the slides off in my head. There are lots of trace route tools that do a great job. Yeah, that was, I took 504 a long time ago. Yeah, and 560. And, uh, the and trace 560, route stuff was in 560. A long time ago as well. Uh, let's see. Algosec launches a network security policy management as a service. I, this 
this actually is kind of cool. <laughs> it, this kind of makes sense, right? And because I think that firewall management is probably one of those low hanging fruit exercises that you can outsource to a company. And and look, like who better than a company that specializes in network policy management to outsource, you know, some of the stuff to? This is a very common activity that you would outsource to an MSSP. Um, is to take care of your firewall rule changes. And then when mm-hmm. people blame the firewall, you can just blame your MSSP and everyone has a, has a great day. Um, and then everyone's good. Have you, have you read the Phoenix Project, John? Uh, yes, actually. I think you have tried to get me to read it and then Chris Brenton got me to read it. And yeah, yes, yes, I have. So uh, I, I'm, re- I'm listening to it um, as it's been some time. And I, um, what's interesting is they're coming out with the next version of it. Mm-hmm. that is was released uh according to amazon and i have to catch up with uh with gene kim uh i you know i wanted to get him back on the show to talk about this is it's a big deal uh so was, if you haven't read the original one or you haven't read it in some time go back and uh reread it and uh, the reason i mentioned that is just how, listening to it is a whole new experience there's this fantastic moment and like i'm laughing is gene kim reading it no, it is a different uh, reader, different narrator. I, I think it says okay. who the narrator is. I think his name's Chris. Um, okay. In, in, that reads it for Audible. And it, there's just like hilarious moments all the time where I'm just laughing because like, like I've been in that meeting before. Like the meeting you're describing in the book I've been in before. And I think a lot of, of us that read Phoenix, Pro- Phoenix Project, uh, you know, had that experience. And so they're, they're in like a, a SEV1 critical uh, response meeting and everyone's blaming each other and then they get to the point where they're they're blaming security because it's always a firewall change that causes the issue and i'm just rolling on the floor laughing every like, time i've been there so many times and so to have a service that does that i think you know there is a certain level of understanding that I obviously have to have about your environment however algosec makes in many others firemon and others make tools that make it easier for you to understand your environment and the impact of a change um and so th- this could be i think a good thing I don't know. Well, and I, I like a lot of people think it's like a self-help by, book for IT, but it's actually written as a story. And um, it, it, it's just it's just it's just a really, really funny book to read. Um, so it, it's it's pretty awesome. Hold on a second. <clears throat> this interruption is brought to you by the person in the, the gray shirt. I don't know if I saw the person shirt who was interrupted, John. During the broadcast, I, I think I need to go sign something. I, I have a bit of an emergency. I'll be right back, everybody. Okay, As it's a Paul Sev talks One. About, this is a perfect segue for you to talk about Wu Tang because I know Jack about Wu Tang <laughs> Clan. This is a Sev One critical emergency. Blame the firewall guy, John. Blame the firewall guy. So, I, how do you pronounce this jackass's last name? Is it Screlly? Screlly? They call him Pharma Boy. That's way easier to pronounce. But it's Martin Screlly. AKA Pharma Boy um, is just a world class jackass, pretty much. He's the one that uh, jacked up prices on uh, what was it? The was it a, a drug for for AIDS patients? Diaprim. Yeah, there's. It, but he's also been convicted now uh, of fraud, and so let's back up to 2015 though, where. Pharma Boy comes into play with nothing to do with pharmaceuticals, but he paid $1 million for a Wu-Tang album, uh, Once Upon a Time in Shaolin. Now, uh, was it $2 million? Oh, it was $2 million. $2 million. Um, so myself being a big fan of the, the Wu-Tang clan, um, and, and you know, it, it's kind of funny that he paid $2 million for it and cash rules everything around me. I'm sure there's a joke in there somewhere. Um, dollar, dollar bills, y'all. But so <laughs> the deal was... They would sell him the album, and he couldn't commercialize the album. He can't sell it or make money on it. He can release it for free if he wanted to, and he did release some of it for free. I guess he said, if he said Donald Trump got elected president, that he would go on some webcast uh, platform uh, and, and play some of the album, which he did, um, which for hardcore Wu-Tang fan, fans out there, yeah, I, I listened to that, uh, which is ridiculous that I actually spent time looking that up, but... Um, so now, uh, he's in jail awaiting a ruling of up to 20 years, uh, in prison because he's been convicted of fraud. Like other than being the jackass that bought the Wu-Tang album that didn't release it and the jackass that was like cranking up prices on, uh, drugs that could actually help people. 
Dara Prim, it, it was and it was like a a, a five thousand percent increase. Ridiculous, ridiculous. Um, it, it also, uh, it, he has Little Wayne's much delayed uh, the Carter Five and a Picasso painting. Um, we'll we'll have to see. So he also has this Once Upon a Time in Shaolin album, which is the fa- now famous Wu Tang album that has yet to be released. Is now I essentially property of the U.S. government is from what I've read. Now there's a whole other controversy around this album in that there was another Wu Tang member that produced the album where other Wu Tang members uh, rapped on what they thought was some other album, but it ended up being Once Upon a Time in Shaolin. Those Wu Tang members were paid for that work, but didn't get a cut of the two million uh, that was paid to I think RZA for uh, that album. So there's a whole, it's a fascinating story, has absolutely nothing to do with enterprise security, but it's an absolutely fascinating story uh, to go read. Uh, and if we, who knows, we may, we may get a public release of, I guess we're, we're being optimistic. Actually, I thought there was a bunch of uh, YouTube clips of, of the, of the album. Well, there's one clip where uh, the farmer boy is actually playing, um, I don't mm-hmm. know, it was like a minute or two of. Uh, or several minutes of the album. Uh, he did that because Donald Trump was elected president. I'm not sure if it was in protest or support, or he just didn't know. Like He was, just he was like, drunk. He was like, you know what? Well, like flip a coin. Or you know what? If Donald Trump's elected president, I will go on and play you know, four minutes of this album. So you can go listen to four minutes of it and, and watch Farmer Boy in, in the video. And you just, you just want to punch this guy in the face, to be quite honest with you. Like, he just, for so many reasons, including disrespecting the Wu-Tang, because then there's that whole other thing when he was on trial, they <laughs> were talking to the jury members, and I guess all the, the jury... One of the inter- jury members got disqualified yeah. for it. And he said, the not guy- only is this guy basically a jackass, but he disrespected the Wu-Tang. And that shows you in the court-like testimony for it, in his public record, <laughs> that this person is upset because he disrespected you- the Wu-Tang. <laughs> Do you think that some of the bad stuff is just karma for the disrespect against Wu Tang? It could be. It could be. I, I think this guy is just a, a total piece of crap, to be honest with you. Uh, yeah. And so, well, he's threatened to burn it a couple of times. Yeah. Like he's. Yes. Like, yeah. So. I mean, there's just, again, one of the more fascinating stories that I read this week outside of uh, information security. And I've uh, kind of pledged to include a couple of stories every once in a while, uh, maybe even once a week on a, a, a different show. Or I'll just I'll pick a random story and we'll just talk about it, even though it really has nothing to do uh, with, with anything. Security. This one happened to do with Wu Tang. Usually it's they're centered they're centered around week. marijuana because <laughs> the stories about marijuana are really really interesting. Like the stuff you read is just, I mean I couldn't what, make this, some of this what, stuff up. Like there was the guy mean? I forget where he was, but he worked for the U.S. Postal Service, and apparently he had this really good nose for sniffing out marijuana and was stealing it from people's packages that were sent in the U.S. <laughs> mail, which apparently is, is like a thing and pretty popular because when they raided his house, he had 60 pounds of, 60 pounds of marijuana in his house. Go that's figure. Just, that's just a lot that's a of lot. pot. To that's be, a lot of pot. Chuck the Sniffer. That was Chuck his nickname. Sniffer. His nickname was Chuck the Sniffer. And on <sighs> that note, <laughs> we will take a short break, come back, and talk you know, about hacking the Olympics. We're gonna- Oh, <laughs> my 